So we're turning back the clock. If you recall, um, Canada joined the uh, UN war um, or to the protection of civilians in Libya back in 2011. And uh, these are two of our former cabinet ministers in Canada. This is John Baird, Minister of Foreign Affairs, said we did it to protect civilians. Um, our Minister of Defence, Peter McKay, said we did it in order to, to, save, to save lives. So we're going to hold them at that word because we believe what they say. And so we want to look, if that's what our terms of reference are, how did we do? <laughs> and um, it's interesting, the cost of that military mission was $347 million overall. Go ahead. And guess what? We were successful. It was a successful mission um, because Gaddafi was no longer in office. It was officially deemed a success and the government threw an $800,000 party. So I'm just going to write these figures on the board even though I'm not the economist. And um, 800,000. Don't have to do any caring. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this is our budget that we're going to work with. Okay, go ahead. Long-term consequences. I'm not going to give you much because I don't need to. I don't think I need to give you this recent history lesson. But this is a report that was actually put out by England um, just within the last few weeks, and this is a, a, an excerpt. The long-term consequences of the NATO uh, incursion was political and economic collapse, inter-militia inter and inter-tribal warfare, humanitarian and migrant crises, widespread human rights violations, the spread of Gaddafi redeemed weapons across the region, and the growth, of, the growth of ISIL in North Africa. In short terms, it is a failed state on the brink of full-on civil war. So that's where we are. So what if we had used nonviolence? And was there a better way to support the Arab Spring? So we're going to use the model of unarmed civilian peacekeeping, which you may have heard from other uh, um, sessions in this conference. Unarmed civilian peacekeeping, very briefly, is the uh, utilization of trained professionals to engage in volatile areas to reduce violence through a specific means. And this is just uh, a quick diagram of typically what they are. Interpositioning, protective accompaniment, protective presence, confidence building, uh, training, early warning, early response. So that's just kind of a model. I'm not going to go into that um, too much for time. So what, what would that have looked like? And um, what, uh, can you imagine if Canada, through a Department of Peace, had responded to this urgent humanitarian issue and responded to um, a growing group within uh, Libya itself who wanted to depose um, the country of a ruthless dictator and wanted to bring about, as our minister said, save lives and what was the other one? What did our minister yeah. say? Protect. Protect civilians. Okay, so let's just pretend we had sent in a, an, a cadre of unarmed civilian uh, peacekeepers. So the UCP people are not activists. They are there actually to support on the ground the grassroots movement. And so that's the difference. And so they really are there to create space and uh, so that the indigenous, nonviolent, grassroots, community-based activists can do their job. Go ahead. We know actually that this works. Um, and these are graphs that Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan produced. Many of you know their work. Uh, and those of you who don't, they produced a book that was published about five years ago comparing hundreds and hundreds of uh, nonviolent and violent campaigns over the last about 110 years. And they systematically looked at what was more successful. And they showed that nonviolent campaigns actually to overthrow uh, governments, to bring about democracy, were significantly more successful. Okay, next slide. Also showed that the rate of success of nonviolence increased significantly as time progressed over the last number of decades. And what's the probability of being a democratic de democracy five years after the conflict had ended? If it were a violent campaign, 4%. Nonviolent campaign, 41%. Uh, very strong statistical significance for that. Next one. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't. Okay, another just a probability of experience of civil war within 10 years of any conflict. 
If it were a violent campaign, 43%, nonviolent campaign, 28%. Again, uh, statistical significance is not quite as rigorous, but still uh, definitely um, demonstrating a correlation. Uh, does anyone have any quick, uh, that was just a real quick overview, just about the, the evidence about nonviolent resistance, how it works. Okay. So what we wanted to do, though, is um, look at what other things could we use to have, if we turn back to time, to demonstrate what could have worked. I'm going to turn it over to you. <clears throat> so clearly with the, the work that Chenoweth and, and her partner did, there was, there was some very strong evidence that the nonviolent means were more successful in a very meaningful way. But they're, they're difficult to measure the impacts on society and uh, a lot of decision makers tend to gravitate towards monetary arguments where it's easy to create some sort of a cost-benefit analysis. So what we decided to do was take the work that was started by Chenoweth who, who created, as Randy mentioned, I believe a 104-year survey of, of countries that had been engaged in both violent and nonviolent uh, resistance over that period. It was, I believe, 3,000 entries of, of uh, information. So we started to look at that from an economic perspective, and we'll kick over to the next one. I can jump that one, too. I want to get to our, yes. So now I get to be economic -y on you. Uh, one of the, the very most standard models that we see in economics is that we've got some sort of a measure of output as some function of capital and labor combined. This is very simple, and we can come up with all sorts of elaborations on it. Uh, we can get creative in how we consider output, uh, what it includes, whether that should be increases in the quality of natural capital. We could uh, look at social elements of it, but they're harder to measure. So the typical economist will look at the production that's, that's sold in open markets with a, an easy monetary backing. Under this model, using this, we find that uh, the function here is just some measurement of the type of technology that we use to bring together capital and labor together. And this is very standard, accepted by most economists and used by most economists in projections of the macroeconomy. If this is the case, if this is the case, then our, our rate of economic growth or increasing our access to goods, services, and, and uh, measurements of well-being is dependent on three big things. Our rate of technological advancement, our quantity and quality of capital that's available to our productive system, the quantity and quality of labor that's available to that productive system. So if true, the rate of capital accumulation is a very important factor in determining our rate of growth overall. And uh, we can kick over to the next one. No, no surprises, it's very well understood by economists as well that violence leads to destruction of our infrastructure, destruction of our capital stock, and uh, the, the destruction or the, uh, the abasement of our, uh, our labor pool as well with great loss of life. And it creates a, a tumultuous economic environment which leads to economic downturns particularly leads to a low rate of savings because people will have less faith in the system to which they're entrusting their money and will have less money to set aside for savings. And savings is our biggest pool of loanable funds or our source that we grow capital from in taking that money and converting that into hard capital and infrastructure. So what we wanted to do was take a look at wealth as a proxy for savings, it's certainly determined by our rate of savings. We've got very good numbers from the UN, from the World Bank, on the rate of wealth accumulation and on the gross, gross quantity of it. We've also got very, very well established figures on GDP around the entire world. Uh, on the rates of growth, we've got population figures from around the world. Using the Chenoweth data set, we took a look at the primary means of uh, agitating for, for this sort of political change, be it violent or nonviolent. And we wanted to look at this relationship. We've got some sort of a function around our growth and our, our total level of GDP production or what's going on in the country in terms of creating stuff. We've got population changes and we've got some sort of a measure. And we limited our examination to just those countries that had gone through some sort of a political uh, upheaval, be it violent or nonviolent. And our, our hypothesis was 
that we should see a decrease in the rate of wealth accumulation or overall level of wealth when we've got a primary, uh, primary means of achieving the political change being violent, leading to that destruction. So we, we unfortunately, our fellow who did this statistical <coughs> analysis, uh, I built the model with Noor, but he would be far better able to, to answer questions about the technical side of this model if anyone were interested. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the model that we looked at. We looked at a function of wealth uh, the LN simply means we took a logarithm of it for mathematical reasons. We had some sort of a, a, a value in here, some sort of a, a starting point. We had factors in front of the line of our GDP. We, we set it back thinking that uh, the previous year's GDP growth would have a bigger influence on current wealth production, wealth accumulation than the current year would. We, we look back two years. We looked at populations over a two-year period, and we also looked at this primary means of violence. We looked at this across, I believe we had somewhere in the order of four or 500 uh, cases that we looked at around the world across time and across countries. And when we, when we did our analysis of this, what we expected to see, sorry, one, one back there, Randy. We expected to see a negative, num negative number here in front of the, the primary means of, of uh, achieving this change. If it were violent, it should have a negative impact on our wealth accumulation. You can tell that we just fabricated these fairly recently. I've got to read them to see what we've said, <laughs> uh, which is just summarizing what we've just discussed. So what we did find when we ran our statistical analysis on this using uh, panel data means we did find a negative, uh, a negative uh, figure in front of that primary means of, of achieving the political change. Now, again, I wish we had our st statistician with us. These are fairly weakly significant, but significant results, meaning that this does have approximately a 10, uh, a 90 percent probability of being a significant factor in determining the rate of wealth accumulation. This is not a staggeringly strong result, but we were also doing this kind of off the side of our desks, and it's encouraging enough that we'd like to see a little bit more work done on this to elaborate on the model and to look in a slightly more comprehensive way to develop the model and to dig in a little bit deeper into, into how strong this impact is. Essentially what we're saying though is that we can have an economic argument that if you decide to go down the, the, the road of violent upheaval, it's going to have a negative long-term impact on your economy's growth and on the well-being of the people within that nation. Bringing in this monetary argument into, into this where we've got very strong results showing that the effective results of the nonviolent means of, of political change are far more effective in terms of affecting an actual change in the government, the long-lasting level of democracy, and the other figures that Chenoweth uh, looked at. And Do you want me to speak to this, or? I, I think you could, Randy. I, that's my chunk that I would like to share with you. Okay, please feel free to jump in. Um, so we think this is, uh, there are some good implications about this. I think uh, we were able to just sh show, you know, statistically that uh, we all kind of know that there's short-term impl implication about going off to war, but this shows, demonstrates there's a correlation for long-term implications for, um, it makes sense, according to this, to support non-violent um, means, in the case of Libya, because the long-term uh, economic output is agreeable. Um, it, again, this correlates with the seminal work done by Chenoweth and Stefan, and just again provides some empirical support for that innovative methods that support foreign policy goals for the Canadian government. You know, I think you know as you stated uh, initially, uh, when you when you speak to politicians, uh, econ economics is almost always at the forefront of what we talk about when we try and get elected, right? And we need to push the envelope on this so that this type of stuff is talked about. I think there's one more slide. Uh, you know, so this is, a, I think, what we, you know, this was not 
that hard a study, I say, is the one who didn't do any of the math. <laughs> um, but it kind of opens the door for a lot of other questions. Um, we need to do more cost analysis of unknown selling peacekeeping. We have a budget of $340 million, $800,000, because we're not going to hold a party. We're just going to have a big potluck at the end of it. <laughs> so what would that look like if we had that much money and we could have, how could we have supported the nonviolent um, uprising in Libya? Because it did exist. And si similar to how you talk about uh, in um, uh, Ireland, we never heard about it, and it got co-opted very quickly. So I think if we turn back the clock, it, we could have supported that, especially with a hefty budget. Um, the other thing uh, is, especially with climate change, that we need to add is there is such a huge saving as far as carbon output if you want to respond in a nonviolent way for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, and also we need to think about more of the questions, how we can bring this stuff and actually influence policy, and I think that comes more to the work you're doing as well. And I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.